I'm Leo Wood of Kit Guru. Last week I previewed eight motherboards Intel Z490 platform for Comet Lake S, and today I have received two CPUs, the Core i9-10900K and the Core i5-10600K. No Core i7, which is a shame, but I wasn't actually expecting the i7. So the i9 and the i5. We are between embargoes still. We've had the embargo for the news, which means I'm allowed to show you processors and talk turkey about details. Indeed, Matthew did a news piece about Comet Lake S uh, that coincided with my Z490 piece. So that's behind us. We have prices for motherboards now. The speculation about pricing of motherboards when I did it with the Z490 boards was pretty much on the money. I was slightly under when it came to the most extreme case, which was the Gigabyte Z490 Aorus Extreme Water Force. That is a monstrous £1,200, but realistically, who's going to buy a board at that sort of price? The MSI Meg Godlike was £799. Uh, I was in the right ballpark, but even so, £800 for motherboard is a lot. The review kit of two CPUs comes with a motherboard. Board. You either get the ASUS Maximus 12 Extreme, which costs £850 approximately, or the Gigabyte Z490 Extreme. So they're both called Extreme. That is £750. We're talking very expensive motherboards. No matter what, the motherboard that Intel is sending out is going to cost more than the most expensive CPU in the product stack, which suggests that Intel thinks those processors need a lot of juice to support them. The next embargo to lift will be pricing of the CPUs. Right now, you can pre-order one of these motherboards, but you don't even know how much the processor is going to cost, let alone be able to put your name on one, or indeed for that matter, Will you know whether Intel can actually supply the part? Let's hope they can supply CPUs. We have dollar pricing for trades of a thousand, which is Intel's standard metric for CPUs. So we can speculate that the i9 should retail for about 500 pounds, the i7 for about 400 pounds, and the i5 for about 300 pounds. That might be a tad less. However, with previous launches, I'm thinking about the ninth gen and eighth gen, Supplies were limited, prices were increased. The i9-9900K should have been £500 and it was initially 600 maybe even 650 because supplies were very tight. If the same is true of 10th gen, then once again, I can imagine pricing going up. But let's for the moment work on the basis of 500 pounds and £300 for the i9, i5, i7. We've got a massive stack of parts from Intel, uh, both with and without integrated graphics. The range of clock speeds that they offer is huge because we've got base speed, all core turbo speed, turbo boost two, turbo boost three, and thermal velocity boost, which in each case adds another 100 megahertz to the speed of the processor. Turbo boost three, we were familiar with from the previous X series parts. Thermal velocity boost is entirely new. These numbers, frankly, at the moment are just hocus pocus until we can actually test the processors and confirm what they mean in the real world. And right now, I haven't yet plugged these processors into boards. They are in mint condition. I deliberately have done it so it doesn't colour my views on Intel's claims because I am not allowed to discuss performance until the 20th of the month. So you're looking at uh, 10 or so days until the actual hard launch, which is when reviews will go live and you get all the performance goodies. So what am I doing here if I can't talk about performance? I'm going to talk briefly about my approach to my reviews that will be coming up in about 10 days time because there's a certain amount of the review which I can pretty much write in my head right now, and it's going to be common to every other reviewer on the planet, which is going to go something like this. Intel shouldn't be on 14 nanometer, we think plus plus at the moment. They should have been on 10 nanometer a long while ago, and possibly even on 7 nanometer, or certainly moving towards 7 nanometer. Therefore, the architecture, the Skylake architecture in these processors should be a distant memory, but it's not. So instead, they bumped up the core count of these relatively elderly and crusty processors. And we all know that they were using four cores for years and years and years with hyperthreading, so four cores, eight threads. And then AMD came along with Ryzen, which pushed Intel with Coffee Lake to go to six cores, then eight cores, and now 10 cores with hyperthreading. So we can thank AMD for competition, and Intel has responded, and they've suffered with power and thermals because the package and the design was never intended to be stretched to four to six to eight. How it's gonna behave with 10, we have no idea. Everyone's gonna say that. 
The big question at the moment, the gap in my understanding is exactly how much juice this process is going to require to run at a speed even approximately close to that 5.1 gigahertz. The thing about the clock speed, Intel's very keen on clock speed because it's an advantage they have over AMD. Again, every reviewer will tell you the same thing. Intel is saying we can do 5 gigahertz plus, AMD is running, at, depending on the processor, 4.2, 4.3, 4.4 gigahertz. But of course, we're talking 8 cores. Uh, the 12 core is actually in a PC down by the camera. And then this is the 16 core. The point is AMD is offering a core count that Intel cannot even think about in the, the desktop format. And for money that Intel is mm, kind of competing with, depending on how you look at it, you can buy eight cores of AMD Ryzen 7 3700X for 300 pounds, pay slightly more for the 3800 if you want for very slightly more clock speed. You can pay £440 here in the UK after a recent discount for the 12 core, or you can pay £690 for the 16 core, to which Intel will say, yes, indeedy, how many games require 8, 12 or 16 cores? We've got clock speed. That is the divide, and obviously we're going to look at that very closely during our benchmarking and then leading into the review. One of the big changes that Intel has made for 10th gen is that every part in the product stack has hyperthreading. So every time you hear core, you can double it for thread 10 cores, 20 threads, 8 cores, 16 threads, and so on down the stack. With the 9th gen, Intel deliberately crippled the desktop stack. So you could have an i9-9900, which was 8 cores and 16 threads, or you could have a lesser part, which was 6 cores and 6 threads. It made absolutely no sense at the time, except to make the i9 all the more special it left a bad taste in the mouth. Once again, AMD has forced Intel to respond. They can't get away with this nonsense anymore. This change makes it almost impossible to compare current Core i7 or Core i5 with previous Core i7, Core i5, because it's not the same hardware. It's got a different number of cores, very likely, and it will certainly have a different number of threads. We, we can only really look at how much money it costs to put a PC together to do a certain thing. The naming is thrown in the air and all messed up. The fact that Intel has been forced to include hyperthreading with every processor is a very good thing. Clock speeds will be of keen interest in my testing. The fact that this Core i9-10900K is described as having a base frequency of up to 3.7 gigahertz, not 3.7, but up to 3.7. Don't know what that means yet. It has an all-core turbo frequency of 4.8 gigahertz. And then we have Turbo Boost 2 of 5.1 on a single core. Turbo Boost 3 of 5.2, again on a single core. And Thermal Velocity Boost of 5.3 gigahertz on a single core or 4.9 gigahertz on all cores. Th thermal Velocity Boost means provided it's happy that the cooling is adequate. So we've got an enormous range of speeds. Let's take that up to 3.7 as being 3.7 all cores. And then let's take the Turbo 4.8 all cores. That's obviously going to take a lot of power. We've seen this with the i9 900K. It took typically 180 watts to run the eight cores at 4.7 gigahertz. So running an extra 25% of cores very slightly faster. That's going to take more juice. Logically, it's going to be 220, 230 watts. What the temperatures will do remains to be seen. The only change we're aware of within Comet Lake S versus Coffee Lake is that Intel has thinned the die by a 0.3 mil. They've taken that off the silicon. Silicon is an insulator, so they're able, hopefully, to get the heat out through the soldered heat spreader somewhat better than previously. The overall height of the package remains the same, which means that coolers can be transferred from LGA 11.5X to the brand new socket LGA 1200. That's right, LGA 1200 and Z490. We're talking about a new platform. Again, I touched on this in my motherboard preview. So all these boards here are Z490 and LGA 1200. These are the four boards I'm intending to use for individual standalone reviews. So that's the Gigabyte Z490i Aorus Ultra, which is Mini ITX. Here we have the MSI Meg Ace, which I did in the preview. That's priced at 400 pounds. Looks on the face it to be very good. 
This ASRock Z490 Steel Legend wasn't here for the preview. It arrived quite late in the day. That's priced around the £200. That's interesting. You actually see a budget board. And then I have the ASUS Maximus 12 Hero priced at £430. This, by contrast, is the Maximus 12 Extreme priced at £850. The problem is that Z490 appears to bring very little to the party. It supports the new processor socket. You can run slightly faster DDR4 than you could previously, but as XMP is going to run the DDR4 way beyond specification anyway, and you can buy memory going to about 5 gigahertz, the rated speed is pretty much irrelevant. The features that come with Z490, so you've got PCI Express 3 still, and you can have two graphic slots, so you can run SLI or Crossfire X, should you much care about those in your gaming PC. You cannot run Gen 4 storage, and you can't get Gen 4 bandwidth on your graphics card. You do get support with the new chipset for 2.5 gigabit Ethernet and also for Wi-Fi 6, which is just a nonsense because those features are almost nothing to do with the chipset. You'll find motherboards with those as adding controllers. AMD is going to support Wi-Fi 6 and 2.5 gigabit, 5 gigabit, 10 gigabit Ethernet. It's just a question of paying money for them. So Z490 supports LGA1200, which is uh, compatible with the new 10th gen processors. And we understand 11th gen uh, Rocket Lake S will also use LGA 1200. We would usually expect the next gen processor to come along in a year. However, there are rumors that Rocket Lake S will be coming later this year. Don't know what to make of those rumors and that the processor will run up to eight cores. I'm looking here at a 10 core 10th gen part. So the idea of an eight core 11th gen part I don't know what that's all about. However, the other rumor is that Rocket Lake S will support PCI Express Gen 4. So if you take your new processor, drop it into your existing or soon to be bought Z490 motherboard, you may indeed suddenly gain support for Gen 4 storage and hopefully Gen 4 graphics, which at the moment isn't of much interest. But when Big Navi comes along will be of keen interest. Later this year, we're fully expecting Nvidia to launch its latest graphics chip and we're expecting that to have support for PCI Express Gen 4, in which case Gen 4 motherboards will suddenly become all the more interesting. Intel has to get on the bandwagon, you would think. So the idea that the existing Z490 motherboards with 11th Gen Rocket Lake S later this year sounds crazy. There might be some truth in it. The real problem here is that 12th Gen Intel processors, Alder Lake S is the rumored name, they are supposed to use a completely different architecture, eight cores uh, regular and eight little atom type cores, so eight plus eight equals 16. That's the only way that uh, Intel can apparently compete with AMD's genuine 16 core processors. Those 16 core processors are going to run on a whole new socket, LGA 1700. So Z490 would appear to cover 10th and 11th gen Intel processors, which you would expect to be 2020 and 2021, but it's possible it's going to be 2020 and late 2020, which would be quite peculiar. So I've got a stack of motherboards, I've got my new processors, I've got some claims from Intel about uh, clock speeds and boost algorithms. The TDP rating of 125 watts of these parts is clearly nonsensical because the previous 95 watt parts would run 180 watts. So we're talking common sense as north of 200. There was recently a rather indiscreet video by MSI and video cards grab some frames from it showing some charts where MSI is saying power draw could be up to 300 watts for an overclocked i9-10900K. And the math supports that. I mean, it's a, it's a horrendous figure. So the question do doesn't become, can you supply the juice to the processor? It's how the heck do you cool the thing? I'm looking forward to finding that out. Uh, pushing towards 300 watts in a desktop package. Wow. But if it can take it, I mean, th that'll be quite something. And the performance and clock speed should be something to see. But uh, I'll believe it when I see it. That's all I can say. We've got the new Intel processors. I've got my comparison processors. I've got Z490 motherboards galore. I've got graphics cards lined up. I'm ready to go. It's time to start benchmarking. And then we can see what we should make of the brand new Intel 10th Gen Comet Lake S and Z490 motherboard combo. If you like this video, give it a thumbs up, hit the bell button, subscribe, head over to our merch store and buy a t-shirt, head over to kickguru.net to read Matthew's news piece about 10th Gen processors, and indeed to have a look at my preview of the motherboards from a week ago. I'm going to order for Kick Guru. I've got processors.